Hello everyone, um, I'm talking today about a parent's view of childhood cancer research. So this is a parent's view, it's my view, it might be shared by everyone but hopefully you'll understand my perspective. I just want to say thanks to Angela and to the CCLG for asking me to speak today, it's a great event. So this is my son Oscar, he was diagnosed with stage 4 high risk neuroblastoma just a few weeks after this picture was taken. He was three, and that was November 2011. As some of you will know, it's a notoriously difficult disease to treat, with high rates of relapse and very poor prognosis for many kids, despite the fact that they undergo really intense and aggressive treatment. At the point of diagnosis, um, listening to our oncologist speak about the disease burden that Oscar had, I thought, this is impossible, we can't overcome this. And for me, I didn't want to put him through really aggressive and toxic treatment if I was going to lose him anyway. So I asked the oncologist that, you know, is there any point? What he said was, it's a challenge, but there's a chance. And for us as parents, that's all we needed to hear. We started fighting from that point forward. So Oscar, over a period of two and a half years, had multiple therapies in Belfast, London, and Philadelphia. He did achieve no evidence of disease in April 2013, but relapsed just a few months later and then died on the 8th of May 2014. For me, I don't view Oscar's death as being down to the fact that he had cancer, but down to the fact that we ran out of options to treat it. In other words, the science let him down, the research has not been sufficient, and so much more has yet to be done. So when you hear those words, your child has cancer, it really just, your world as you know it, ends at that point. I made this slide deliberately busy and confusing because that's what it's like inside our mind as a parent at that point. You're overcome with anxiety, fear, you just can't believe what is happening to you. This happens to other people, this doesn't happen to normal people like us. It's difficult to take it all in. So we signed consent forms for Oscar to enter the Siapin high-risk neuroblastoma study, and that brought a whole other level of terminology we, we weren't familiar with. Um, we were hearing words like differentiation, consent, eligibility, randomization, and to be honest, we were quite shocked that there was no treatment path that had been found and decided upon that had a good chance of working. We, we didn't realize that kids enter clinical trials because the answers aren't there yet. So it really is difficult to take it all in. And think back to Dr. Ron Grant's presentation here last year when he was talking about informed consent. When parents are in this state of shock and fear, can it be considered informed consent? That really struck a chord with me. But once you start digesting the news, those feelings, they don't disappear, but they definitely reduce and a new phase comes for many parents. I suppose it's like trying to get control again and get back into the driver's seat. You, re you do loads of research, you make many connections, you really try to find out as much as you possibly can about the disease that your child is facing because although we had absolute trust in our treating team, we really felt like they treat many, many kids. How can they be experts in this one variation of the disease that our son has? So for us, it was really important that we became experts as much as we could in what was out there and what could be done. And as parents, you truly advocate for your child. So before Oscar was diagnosed with cancer, we had no concept of what a clinical trial was, to be honest. Um, the definition given by the NHS is that it's a type of clinical research that compares one treatment with another, but for parents it is so much more than that. We understand that these are experiments and that they come with risks, but we enter with real hope that this is going to be a treatment option that will give us the result we need for our child. I'm focusing on clinical research today because that's what's tangible to us in the clinic. You know, when we're running out of options and we hear of a trial that might be a potential for us, that's what's important. 
So clinical research is absolutely vital because other words, how are we going to find the answers? We need to improve survival rates, but we also need to reduce the long-term side effects. And I think it's fascinating that in the UK, over 60% of children with cancer enroll in clinical trials, but less than 5% of adults. And this is probably because it's the only way for children to access novel therapies, new drugs, and really the answers have not been found yet. But of course, for some types of childhood cancer, there aren't even any clinical trials available with potentially curative effect, and that's just devastating. So again, going back to the point where you enter the world of childhood cancer, it's like being thrown into the center of a maze. You're so confused, and you've got to find your way out. The clock's ticking, the stakes are so high, because it's your child's life that's at stake here. A lot of difficult choices have to be made, and although you share those with your treating team, for me, it feels like parents are the ones that are going to live with the consequences. We sign the consent forms for the trials. We make the choice at the end of the day, and we will live with the outcome, good or bad. I remember a point at Oscar, um, for Oscar, we had reached a crossroads, and we didn't know what we were going to do next. And I thought, I had a real moment of clarity, thinking, if we make the wrong choice here, he will die. And that's, it's, it's overwhelming to feel that way. And the only thing I can describe it as is it's like playing Russian roulette with your child's life. What if there is only one outcome that's going to work for him, and we choose the other one? It, it's really devastating. Um, and parents need a lot of support from their oncologists and their wider community because the pressure is so great. Talking about hope versus reality, I feel like as parents, we are we're smart. We understand that clinical trials are trying to find um, answers. We know that there's a full team of people behind the scenes deciding the scientific rationale, trying to figure out the statistical significance. But we enter those and we sign those forms because we have hope that this is going to have a curative or life prolonging effect for our child. And that's what's important to us at the end of the day. Even in early phase trials, we hope that we're going to fail. We're going to be the one unexpected outcome that's going to benefit our child. And making the right choice for the right reason. We did aggressively pursue cure for Oscar, but we came to a point where things had changed and it became about quality of life and really value in the time that we had left with him and given him the best quality that he could have. So when we reached that crossroads again, I felt like other parents would be looking at us and judging us, thinking you have given up on your child, but that's not true. Every single decision, whether it's entering a clinical trial, seeking a second opinion, seeking therapy elsewhere, or moving to palliative care, that's driven by the sheer love you have for your child, and it's the right choice for you and for them. So frustrations that parents feel with the current research landscape. Proving the science versus curing the child, and by this I mean we, as I've already said, we're driven because we want to save the life of our child. But in the research world, of course, <coughs> everyone else has different objectives. A real tension exists, I think, because even though I understand the need to prove the science and to find the answers, does that mean that I would want my child to be on the placebo arm of an early phase trial? No, definitely not. Children are not many adults, and we all know that they're treated with chemotherapy and radiation and things that are 30, 40, 50 years old, given adjusted doses in the hope that it's going to work for them. But it's not the case, and even considering these things with the long-term toxicities that they feel, if someone starts a therapy at 65 and experiences a toxic side effect, is that the same as someone who's five and lives with that for the rest of their life? No. And children really need to be considered and understood in their own right and the needs of their disease and their life 
has to be considered. The delay in medical advances for children. I was at a conference where a prominent German researcher said, we don't want to be the generation of oncologists that's handle, handing out therapy just to maintain this current survival plateau that we've reached. So it's not just us that feel this frustration, but what can we do about it? I think parents joining together to really voice these concerns and be vocal about it, and Debbie's going to speak about Unite to Cure. I think it's really crucial that we do that because otherwise everyone's unaware of this you know, chasm that exists for kids because you would think the children with cancer are given a huge priority. That's the morally right thing to do in terms of funding and focus and trying to find cures, but it's just not the case and it needs to be the case. So we've got to change that. And then being overlooked by industry due to financial considerations. And here I'm talking about drug development. And again, I understand the fact that few children are diagnosed with cancer. The numbers are very low. So that makes it, with the drugs companies answering to shareholders, it's just not financially clever for them to do this, to enter this realm. But it's not right, and it can't stay that way. And we are looking at different, I'm involved in a working group where we're looking at incentives, different things that can be done, changes to paediatric medicine regulation. Like we've got to do something about this, so let's put our heads together and find a way. And of course, one of the biggest things, cure where possible, it comes at a cost. These statistics are from America and were shared by people against childhood cancer. But if we apply those to the UK, with 1,700 children and young people diagnosed with cancer every year, that would mean only 370 of them live 30 years and don't suffer chronic health conditions. And for me, that's simply not good enough. I did see a survivor speak at a conference again, and he said, I'm cured, but I'm not healthy anymore. And real cure for me means being able to be part of society once again. And we've got to listen to those things, and we've got to really try and change the system. I did, um, a few weeks ago, there were some press releases about a trial in America where kids with neuroblastoma were showing greater survival rates with a new therapy. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. But whenever I read the fact that it's due to tandem stem cell transplants, so two stem cell transplants within a very short space of time, I was absolutely horrified because I saw what that did to my son when he was four, going through one, and I just can't, I just can't believe this is what we're striving to for our kids. You know, it's not good enough. It shouldn't be the gold standard of care to be treating them in this way. So hopes for the future. I feel like parents want to see less toxic and more targeted therapies with a real focus on innovative research for all the reasons that I've given before. A paradigm shift in approach to low prognosis diseases. So if we take a step back, what we're doing right now isn't working, and that's why the survival rates are remaining so low. So there's no point in keeping doing what's not working. We've got to look at the bigger picture again, and you know, ideas like giving immunotherapy upfront alongside chemotherapy. Who's going to be brave enough to step up and do these things for our kids? And it must be done, because as I say, keeping doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome, it makes no sense. Collaboration between researchers and institutions, and I know there is a lot of collaboration goes on, but for parents, protecting IP and publishing papers is not what's important. Sharing ideas and working together and really striving to find cure for our kids is what's important, and it should be the priority for everybody working in this field. And meaningful parent participation in the research process. By this I mean parents do have a lot to offer. You know, we mightn't be scientists, but we've really we've lived through the whole system. We know a lot about it. And those perspectives are so valuable. They've got to be brought to the table. And with Lindley talking about eSmart, I mean a parent led foundation, I imagine for Margot, was key in that. 
Christopher Smile, they've established a platform for paediatric um, precision medicine. So parents aren't just funding research, they're identifying unmet needs and really trying to find solutions to overcome these. So we should be given a seat at the table. And finally, everyone thinks their kids are heroes, and they are. But for us, as parents of children with cancer, it really is true. And this slide's really poignant for me because the parents of these children are all close personal friends of mine, and we followed each other's journeys, the courageous battles that our kids went through, we as parents went through, all the highs and the lows. And very sadly, five out of six of these kids are no longer with us today. So our kids are playing a key role in furthering the science and finding the answers and trying to strive for future generations closer to a cure. And for that reason, I think they should be applauded. Thank you.